Paranormal activity occurs on many college campuses around the world. Several colleges in the Philadelphia area have ghostly legends associated with them. At Beaver College, the former residents of the estate seem to still reside there. At Cabrini College, a tragic love story is the basis for the sightings. And at Temple University, it is the school's founder who provides the ghostly tale. Beaver College in Glensock, several ghosts are rumored to haunt the residents of Hines Hall, Dilworth Hall, and Grey Towers, also known as the castle. It is from the former residents of the castle that all the Beaver College hauntings developed. Nowadays, the castle is home to offices and dorm rooms for Beaver College staff and residents. One hundred years ago, the building of the castle had just been completed. William Welsh Harrison, his wife Bertha, daughter Gertrude, and son William Jr. moved in to their new home in 1898. Lawrence Trumbauer, the building's architect, patterned this Glenside Castle after Onwich Castle in England. The name Grey Towers comes from the castle's numerous towers and the color of the stone. The Harrison family provides the basis for most of the ghost stories associated with Beaver College. Legend has it, the Harrisons were not a happy family. Mr. Harrison was very openly cheating on his younger wife, while some say Mrs. Harrison was not altogether mentally well. Gertrude, the Harrisons' only daughter, secretly married a man of whom her father did not approve. A year later, only a month shy of her 23rd birthday, Gertrude Harrison Anderson died. Reports say she died from blood poisoning following an operation. Although she didn't die in Grey Towers, her funeral services did take place in the grand foyer of the castle. Twenty-four years later, William Welsh Harrison would also be laid out in the castle. It is shortly after William's death that Beaver College obtained the enormous Harrison home. Mrs. Harrison and her son sold gray towers to Beaver College for the price of $712,500. The year was 1929. Some students who have resided in the castle claim to have seen ghosts roaming the halls and visiting the dorms. Could these ghosts be the spirits of William and Gertrude? Or has Bertha returned to seek the happiness she never obtained during her lifetime? Former castle resident assistant Patty Shea recounts some stories she has heard of ghosts in the castle. As a resident assistant in the castle, um, I thought I was pretty prepared when I went to RA camp, but I, I totally was unprepared for the ghosts and the hauntings here in the castle. Um, in one instance, I had a girl that lived across the hall from me who on more than one occasion would come into my room, be completely terrified, 
crying and screaming because she'd be taking an, an afternoon nap and she'd suddenly wake up and see a guy sitting in the chair next to her. And she was, he, she was one of these girls that was completely together. So I knew it wasn't like a fabrication or whatever. She truly was afraid. Um, the biggest thing that happened while I was here was with my friend Ellen. And everyone had been at class and she had just gotten this beautiful ring from her boyfriend. Um, and she went into the bathroom, took the ring off, put it on the windowsill, put her robe on top of it and got into the shower, which was right next to the windowsill. No one was around. She finished the shower, got out of the shower, lifted up the robe and the ring was gone. And she completely freaked out. <laughs> and um, she was so upset that she called the maintenance guy and the cleaning woman who was in another part of the building. At that time, I came back and I saw the commotion going on and I went over and I said, what's going on here? And um, the maintenance man had already had all the marble tiles out, the marble floorboards, everything, a vacuum cleaner, going through all the crevices to see if they could find this beautiful ring. And they had gone through the actions dozens of times and the cleaning woman said, let's just do it one more time. And so they put the robe on the windowsill, they lifted it up and the ring was right there. Several rooms of the castle have their own unique story of ghosts visiting. In each room, you may find different specters waiting to make themselves known. Beaver College student Heather Lindsley tells some of the tales. Being a sophomore at Beaver College and being a part of the Society for Castle Restoration, I've heard a number of stories of hauntings and ghosts and apparitions within the castle itself. One of those stories occurs in what is now the Red Room. Um, the way the story goes is while the Harrison family was living here, uh, many, many people had been stabbed or shot or killed brutally, and they had tried to cover up the walls by painting it over with white paint. And every time they put a new layer of white paint over it, the red from the blood would seep through. So they just became fed up with the idea of having it seep through every time that they painted the entire room completely in Roman red paint. Another story that I've heard deals with the third tier stairwell. Uh, according to the story, there has been a child, a little girl, who is running down the stairs one day wearing a scarf. She trips down the stairs, falls down, her, her scarf gets caught on the banister, and she is choked to death. Um, any, any time now that a, a student is running up the stairs, they can supposedly feel her presence and feel her falling body fall right through them. In the castle's mirror room, where we used to hold many dances, if you're dancing and you look in the mirror and see your reflection, you may sometimes also see the reflection of the Harrisons dancing. And if you happen to see the Harrisons dancing, then you are with the person that you are supposed to marry. Another story that I've heard concerns one of the dorm rooms in the castle. And the story goes, one night around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, one of the girls was up doing her homework while her five other roommates were fast asleep in their beds. Um, at the time she was completing her homework, there was a whispering voice calling out her name. Nobody else was awake, so she became really freaked out, and she ran up to her bed completely covered herself in her blankets, and eventually fell asleep. The next morning, she decided to tell her friends and her roommates, and they, in turn, decided to consult the Ouija board. And according to the Ouija board, there is a male apparition living in the room and likes to sleep with one of the girls in their beds. The castle isn't the only place haunted on Beaver's campus. Hines Hall has a ghost of its own named Max. Max is said to be the spirit of a man once buried in the ground that Hines Hall now stands on. The land was a cemetery at one time. In 1905, William Welsh Harrison wanted to expand his rolling lawn, so he bought a cemetery adjacent to the property. After some court battles, Harrison was given permission to dig up the bodies and have them moved elsewhere. 
around 250 bodies were relocated. Some of the deceased had been buried for over 100 years. Many of the bodies were reinterred in Hillside Cemetery in Abington, Pennsylvania. Max may not have liked the move and decided to stay behind to torment the women of Hines Hall. According to the legend, Max is very particular about the people he haunts. He only visits rooms with two women, one with blonde hair and one with brown hair. Also, one of the women is tall and one is short. Heather Lindsley describes one of the hauntings attributed to Max. One of the roommates had been gone off campus and the other one was visiting one of her friends in another room on the hall. And when she got back to her room, the radio was on, it was on CD mode, and there was no CD in the stereo, but there was a song playing that had been on the CD that was lying on her desk. The only Beaver College legend with no connection to the Harrison family takes place in Dilworth Hall. Being a former resident of Dilworth Hall, I've heard one specific story that has freaked everybody out. According to a story, there was a male student who had lived on the third floor and ran, out, ran down the hall and jumped out the window. And according to the story, around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, if you leave your room, you can see the man running down the hall and jumping out the window. Beaver College is rich with legend and lore about apparitions visiting the campus. Are the Harrisons still wandering around their former home? Do ghosts really visit the castle dorms? Are these specters to be feared? Although we have many ghost stories here at Beaver College, all of our ghosts are known to be relatively benign, where none of them have caused any physical injuries. Five years ago, I had an experience of which I have never spoken before. In 1919, during a Sunday sermon at the Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia, Dr. Russell Herman Conwell revealed the details of a shocking encounter he experienced five years earlier. The event made headlines around the country. Dr. Russell Conwell, pastor of the largest Baptist church in the United States, the founder of Temple University, and a world-renowned lecturer, was not the type of man you would expect to speak of encounters with the dead. However, in 1919, Dr. Conwell's accounts of visits from his deceased wife, Sarah, caused a national sensation. Conwell married Miss Sarah Sanborn of Newtown Center, Massachusetts in 1874. Their years together were happy, but came to an end when Sarah died in October 1910. Dr. Conwell was now alone, suffering from the death of yet another loved one. His first wife, Jenny, died after only seven years of marriage. Tragedy hit home again when their daughter, Agnes, died at a young age. Some scholars of the supernatural felt the unfortunate events in Dr. Conwell's life led to his encounters with Sarah. Conwell felt otherwise. There is no doubt in my mind that we live surrounded by an invisible world of spirits. They are cognizant of our acts and thoughts and can, under certain conditions, communicate with us. Dr. Conwell detailed his wife's first visit for George Knox McCain, a reporter for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. It was early in the morning. Day was breaking, and his bedroom was in part light. As he opened his eyes, he saw a figure seated on the edge of his bed, at the foot where Mrs. Conwell had sat when he was ill or indisposed. He was startled 
and on looking closer, saw that it really was his wife. She was smiling at him across the bed. He regarded the apparition intensely for an instant, and then with the conviction that he was the victim of an illusion, or that his senses were playing him false, he turned on his pillow and closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them again, the vision persisted. He raised himself on his elbow, and for the first time noticed that the lips were moving as though speaking, but he could detect no sound. After a moment or so, he asked, Is that you, Sarah? He is uncertain as to the answer. The figure persisted for a few moments without change. He began to concentrate on the message the spirit was uttering. Little by little, the voice became faintly audible and finally became fairly distinct. Then suddenly, the form disappeared. Sarah made several visits to her husband. During the second visit, Sarah told her husband, Why not dispose of all the jewelry in the vault in the same way? This question is extraordinary because the jewelry that Sarah was speaking of was not placed in the bank until after her death. Dr. Conwell deposited many of his wife's rings, brooches, and necklaces in the bank for safekeeping. However, before doing so, he gave several pieces of her jewelry to relatives as mementos. Dr. Conwell's wife was telling him to dispose of the jewelry in the bank in the same way. Sarah helped her husband locate the Civil War discharge papers that he had not seen for years. She told me that they were in a black lacquered box behind the third shelf of the bookcase in my library. I got up immediately and found them where she had said they would be. I never even remember having seen this lacquered box, and she'd apparently put them there in her own lifetime. The night before Sarah's final visit, Dr. Conwell had a servant hide a gold pencil somewhere in the house. He wanted to test the apparition. Show me where the pencil's hidden. Are you convinced? From that day to this, which has been five years ago now, I have not seen her, but I have been conscious of her presence near me. Six years later, Dr. Conwell died. He and Sarah now lay together in Founders Garden at Temple University. Our story begins with two main characters. There was a girl, a young girl, and a young boy. Let me tell you about the girl first. She was the daughter of the people who lived in this great big mansion. She was an only child, and she was brought here out of Philadelphia when she was quite young. And this was, of course, the place to live out on the old main line, one of these mansions built on the old Welsh tract. And this must have been an idyllic place to have been as a child. Her playmate, her playmate was the son, the little boy, who was the son of the carriage master. And even though they were of two social classes, they were allowed to play together, the little boy and the little girl. And they liked each other. They really had a good time. They looked forward to playing with each other. 
And this happened year after year after year. As they grew older, and their like turned into love. And they really were so fond of each other. They really, really loved each other. And their love went, I'm afraid, a little too far. And she realized, the girl realized, that she was going to have a baby. Well, from their bliss and their joy came great distress. What were they going to do? Finally, one night, even the girl's father, busy, busy man, realized that his daughter was pregnant. And she broke down in tears and confessed. He charged out of the house up towards where the carriage master lived with his son. And we don't know how it happened, but somehow the little boy must have realized that his time was up. And he went up into the tower room and put the rope around the hook up in the center of the tower, and he hung himself. As a matter of fact, that room has always been cold. The colleges use other rooms up there for offices and whatever, but nothing has ever been used in that room. I've been in that room, and it's cold right in the middle of the room, right where he hung. Well, what happened to the girl? Well, as in most folk tales, there's more than one ending. And one ending is that she climbed up onto the balcony out in the foyer of this room and went out and took a swan dive, dove right off of the top of that banister railing and broke her neck and died right on the floor below. I can remember many, many years ago, we used to have dances in that building. We used to roll the rugs back, you know, so we could dance on the nice wood floors. And one time, we made the mistake of having a party on the anniversary of her death. And her blood came up through the, the floorboards. And the president of the college wouldn't allow us to have parties there ever again. No more dances in the mansion foyer. The other ending of the story is that she didn't jump off that balcony. She carried the baby all the way to term, but something must have gone wrong and the baby was stillborn. It wasn't alive. And she took that baby, as the story goes, out back of the mansion down in the apple orchard and buried that baby back in there, back where she and the stable boy must have played when they were young youngsters themselves. Well, as the story progresses and time went by, the story is that the girl has come back several times looking for that little lost child. One girl had a class on Friday afternoon. Her mom had come over from New Jersey to pick her up. And the girl said, Mom, why don't you just lie down on my bed here? I'll lock the door and you'll be, you won't be disturbed. Uh, you can have a nice little nap while I go off to class. And that they did. And she came back in to find the door open. And she said, Mom, did you, did you uh, go out of the room? Did you wake up? Oh, no. Oh, no, her mother said. I stayed here the whole time. I was asleep. Oh, I was awakened by somebody leaning over me. A girl came into the room. She had long hair, and her hair brushed against my cheek, and it woke me up. And she was saying, my baby, my baby, where is my baby? And I said, there wasn't any baby in here, so I told her to buzz off, and she did. Uh, we think that was probably the girl coming back looking for her baby. She's been seen around the balconies of the mansion, often in a blue dress, wandering around, still looking for this child. And the father, her father has been seen again, too. Her father was seen actually by me and two girls as we were coming back across the campus one night. 
and we looked up and in the lights we could see a very tall man coming from the mansion up towards Grace Hall. Great big black coat and a tall stovepipe hat like Abraham Lincoln used to wear. And of course I said, uh, good evening sir, can I help you? And he turned his face towards us, but you couldn't see his face at all. And he disappeared. Was this the father? I don't know. I don't know. But there are these spirits that seem to want to stay around this place. They like to come. And they don't seem to hurt anybody. But if you get scared, 